Hello and welcome to Australia in Space TV. My name's Chris Cubbage. I'm the editor with My Security Media, publishers of the Australia in Space magazine. Today we're joined by Joel Lisk from Adelaide. He's a research asso associate uh, in space and regulation with Jeff Bleich uh, Centre as College of Business, Government and Law with Flinders University there in Adelaide. Joel, thanks very, very much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, we're going to be diving into the Trade Safeguards Agreement, uh, on beg your pardon, Technology Safeguards Agreement, the TSA. This is a, a new agreement just tabled in Parliament uh, here in Australia this week uh, to do with space launch uh, in Australia and US. Uh, sort of, There's a whole range of aspects to this uh, and it's added on to existing legislation here in Australia. Maybe just introduce, introduce us to your role as a research associate and then we'll dive into the TSA and what it means. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, so I work at Flinders University. My main job is to explore essentially the laws that apply to commercial activities in outer space. So a lot of my day job is spent looking at how we get to space and the, and the regulations and the boundaries and the guidelines that apply to that. So whether it's the laws and the authorizations for rockets getting into space or whether we're talking about how we coordinate between different assets when they're there um, and how we even apply the law we have here on the ground to space. So I know it's quite shocking all the time we talk about things like consumer law in space um, and that's kind of my job is to see how law works with this new domain. Would you say, well, it's obviously not a new domain, but would you say mm. here in Australia from a, in a legal framework, it's still relatively new. The, the legislation I looked at stated 2018. Uh, I imagine we've had legislation in the past. What, what is the sort of regulatory framework that uh, we have here in, in relation to space law and space regulation? Yeah, so the Space Launches and Returns Act of 2018 is, I think, the one you're thinking about. It's a bit deceptive, actually. So originally it was introduced in 1998, but had a bit of a refresh and a name change in 2018 to kind of respond to how industry is now and the, bit, the, the changes that we've kind of seen over the last 10 years. But that law celebrated 25 years of being in force in last December, which was pretty amazing. Um, and what it essentially does is allows uh, companies here in Australia to launch rockets from Australia, and it also allows companies to launch payloads from places outside of Australia. That law has quite a narrow focus. It's really just on sending things up to space and bringing them back. But it sits there alongside a lot of other things. So we talk about our radio frequency laws that apply, uh, radio, that, that capture a lot of radio communications and how we send signals. But there's also just the body of law across the country anyway, the normal stuff that we see. And it applies to space activities just like it would any other kind of activities. Great. One, I was looking at the regulation of space activities and high power rockets, part three. Mm. Uh, and I noticed the, the the actual licenses to do with this is for a person. It's not necessarily a, a company in its own right. Is So how does that potentially work? And why maybe would they go for a person uh, to have, hold a license rather than a company? So it can be for, for both. So the person is a bit of that legal, legally, legal terminology we use. So a person can be both a natural person like you and I, uh, but it can also be a company. Okay. This was changed. It did used to actually be restricted to companies. And um, I don't want to get into the details of why, but it's a bit of boring constitutional <laughs> law at the federal level. Got it. Thank uh, you. But we moved past that. And so essentially anyone can launch a rocket if they get the right permit. Um, universities, uh, companies, foreign yeah. companies and individuals can all go around doing it. And some of the penalties, uh, they're up to 10 years now as well and 100,000. So there you go. There is uh, penalties for body corporates uh, there mm. as well. To be honest, it's the first time I actually looked at the legislation, uh, given what we do. Uh, and it's quite interesting in terms of how it's structured. How does the TSA or how do you imagine uh, the new TSA agreement will get embedded into this legislation? Yeah, so I think the Technology Safeguards Agreement is something that's been coming for a really long time. It's something that our domestic industry has been advocating for because it may help them open up to US businesses a little bit better. So I think just to walk back a quick step as to why we need it in the first place, um, technology safeguards agreements are all about importing and exporting technology. So rocket technology is some of the most heavily restricted technology in the world. Um, Australia, along with the US and uh, several other countries, are partners into what's called the Missile Technology Control Regime, which is all about non-proliferation of rocket technology. So essentially stopping the growth of weapons technology that's based on rockets. 
And as some viewers might understand, a, a, law, a rock, an orbital rocket is very much just like a missile, but without the, the weaponized payload. It doesn't it's, go bang. It doesn't go bang unless something goes wrong. Um, and a lot of the technology that originally emerged in the 80s and the 90s was based on, on US missile payload and delivery systems. So the US um, took to the missile technology control regime through what's called the ITAR, um, which is the International Traffic in Arms Regulations. And what it does is it really clamps down on how U.S. businesses can export and, and share the technology they develop within the U.S. and how they can send it overseas. Now, the Technology Safeguards Agreement is there to play a really particular role in allowing U.S. companies to move some of that rocket technology from within the U.S. to other places across the world, and in this case, Australia, uh, without breaching the really, really strict and somewhat scary at times ITAR regulations. Because I know for a lot of industry participants, the moment you mention ITAR, um, it starts to send a shiver up the spine because the compli uh, complications involved there are quite intense. So the TSA will, will actually allow uh, Australian businesses to host US rocket companies and host US built satellites that are subject to these regimes, provided they can meet the terms of this TSA. There's a couple of, we'll come back to, I think, maybe the implications, mm. but is it relatively new? Because ELA launched for NASA, they did three launches last year. So there wouldn't have obviously been restrictions to that. Uh, would that have just been under sort of the normal uh, arrangements under this legislation? So yeah, what, what would be the difference now between sort of NASA launching here last year and now under a TSA? Yeah, so the, the arrangements with ELA, uh, with the Arnhem Space Centre last year and NASA, uh, were quite complicated. Um, I'm not privy to all the details, unfortunately, but um, as it is US legislation, there are exceptions and ways around it, but the technology that was used by NASA was heavily restricted. There were requirements in place that in some respects may mirror aspects of the TSA, especially around restricting access to that technology. So my understanding is a lot of that rocket technology and componentry, once it came into Australia, wasn't necessarily allowed to be touched by anyone who wasn't a US citizen or not already authorised to do so. So the TSA will mirror some of those arrangements, um, but it's not necessarily a new concept. We see TSAs in place with several countries for the US. So New Zealand has one, um, which allows Rocket Lab to launch from New Zealand. So without that, New Zealand would never have an industry. Well, we're um, one of the last, right? So uh, the UK, New Zealand, as you said, I think New Zealand was uh, way back, uh, 2016, if I remember, or 2019. Yeah, which is interesting because it was one of the preconditions essentially to Rocket Lab properly setting up in New Zealand because originally it started there, moved over to the US to develop a little bit more. And when it came to launching, they wanted to launch from New Zealand. So the New Zealand government had to respond accordingly. So what are the new arrangements? Is this going to make it easier? Uh, is it a... Is it a signal to the industry that we are going to be doing more launches here for US uh, companies? We're hopeful. So the idea behind the TSA, and I think it's really important to say, it serves a very narrow purpose. It's all about bringing US launch industry to Australia or bringing US satellites and payloads to Australia to be launched by someone else. It's not about general technology sharing. It just serves this really narrow point. And the idea behind it is it opens Australia up because Australia is quite a good region to launch from. We have a lot of empty space. Uh, we don't have as heavy tr um, air traffic as the US does. Um, it opens up this nice geographical region to US businesses to undertake their activities from. And the hope, especially for those who are building launch facilities here in Australia, is that they'll be able to offer those facilities, facilities to US businesses so they can actually look at that and go, you know what, it is viable for us to bring our rocket no longer have to launch from North America. We can come out here to Australia where it's a bit quieter. Hopefully it's a bit easier and we're a bit closer to some of our Asia Pacific customers. I think there was also a signal that it might start to get cheaper as well. There's always a hope. We don't have to then send our stuff to the other side of the planet. So that removes a few of the export uh, costs and transport. So once those rockets are here in Australia, we can be hopeful that maybe we can see costs reduced for especially Australian and regional participants. And the other aspect, as you, you mentioned satellites and the like, uh, there's mm. also the prospect of debris landing back onto Australian soil. So it's not, not just launch, it's sort of the whole space ecosystem. It is. So it'll include not just debris, but even intentional returns as well. So uh, the US is very strict with its export compliance laws. So um, I think we've seen it recently with Southern Launch and agreement with VADA uh, Industries. So their return theoretically could be also enabled uh, by this arrangement to bring stuff back from orbit to a region in Australia that will be captured. 
Uh, it does also uh, capture what happens when things go wrong. So there's a lot of restrictions there around who can touch debris if a rocket, for example, explodes here in Australia and, and the process about how you recover those um, debris and anything that comes out of it. Maybe a, a, a short call to action, uh, particularly for the legal fraternity. Uh, space law, uh, how do you see this as a growing field? It's obviously, as you mentioned, back in the 90s, the, the law is not new. Hmm. Uh, but is it generally done by specialists in law or do you find more just corporate law lawyers will understand this act and, and how it's applied or do you find it is a very specialist uh, field? I would say it's a little bit of both. So we traditionally it's been a specialist field. It's not one that um, many commercial lawyers would look at as being significantly interesting. If you've only got a small number of players, it's not as interesting um, specialising or dedicating yourself to that because lawyers had on it doesn't generate much revenue and there's only two or three potential clients <laughs> but we are seeing a bit of a shift and um, some of the work we've done at flinders universities is actually working with major law firms across the country in developing their skills around advisory advising space businesses and not just about things around launch but also telling them you know how is financing impacted? How is corporate services impacted? How how do you structure a business in the space economy to grow, to thrive, and to really be successful? So there are law firms and lawyers who are really starting to pay attention to these areas, and it's a real growth aspect for many of them. And I think the other challenge is a lot of, well, some sp uh, space companies are still startups. They're, they're relatively new and fresh, uh, and then to be hit with uh, a range of regulations and then, you know, ITARs and, uh, and, and yeah. TSAs uh, can be quite expensive. But again, uh, there's obviously help out there. Now, my I haven't done much uh, background to this particular interview, so my apologies. But what's there? There's, there is a community group for space law, uh, my understanding is. Have you had much to do with that? Uh, there's a couple of different groups that are available. So the Space Agency now runs a, a Space Regulatory Advisory Collective, which is an right. interesting, um, essentially a, a listening forum for the agency to really engage with the regulated population and those who are interested in regulations, which means you get these nice calls with lots of industry members as well as lawyers kind of coming together and talking about these issues. Um, there are also a whole bunch of other uh, entities. So we've got the Space Law Council of Australia and New Zealand, which emerged a few years ago as a collective of uh, space lawyers and interested professionals who are really working to, to further knowledge and understanding of space law and space regulation. Um, and then the law societies in different states and territories are also doing uh, different things. So here in South Australia with me, we have the, the, the Law Society of South Australia's Space Law Committee, which has members across um, different law firms, including the, the, the independent bar who talk about these issues and really want to understand them more and how it actually impacts not just the legal sector, but how our laws really influence commercial activities. Beautiful. That, that's exactly what I, I knew. I, I read it somewhere uh, in your antecedents. And I know that within the magazine, uh, we've had some articles. So we'll have some links in the show notes uh, for some of those associations. And I think also for the non-lawyer uh, sort of fraternity, uh, anyone interested in space uh, and business, the business of space, I think needs to get across uh, the, the legal side as well. Look, Joel Lisk, Research Associate, Space and Regulation. I knew this would be a good session and informative. Thank you so much for your time there in Adelaide from the Jeff Bleach Centre, College of Business, Government and Law with Flinders University. Joel, thanks very much for joining us on Australian Space TV. Thanks for having me.